Okay, everybody, we're going to get started. Um, welcome to another in our information ecology lecture series. Um, uh, I'd like to start by thanking Jennifer Jenkins, who makes this whole lecture series uh, possible, makes sure it works as well as it does, um, and uh, generally deserves our thanks. And um, a quick plug for those of you who are law students here, or actually not even just law students, uh, Jennifer and I and Anthony Kelly of the music department are going to be teaching a new course uh, this coming fall on musical borrowing um, and the law, um, the history of musical borrowing from Mahler to mashups. Um, and it's going to be half um, music students, composers, and half law students. And no, you don't have to be able to read music, at least I can't, or play music, I can't. Um, uh, but um, so anyway, that, the, that will be uh, announced in the near future. Um, it's um, our real pleasure and delight to have with us uh, Professor Jessica Littman, longtime colleague and friend of everyone associated with the Center for the Study of the Public Domain. Um, Jessica is one of the, the heroes uh, of IP, but um, she does arouse um, two negative emotions in the, the breasts of her friends and colleagues. Um, the, the first is irritation uh, when Jessica states simply and clearly uh, in English that people like to read in under 20 pages ideas which the rest of us struggle to produce in 40 or 50 footnote laden uh, tomes. It just makes us look bad. We've tried explaining the rules of the guild to her. We've shown her the passage where it says that the writing has to be unpleasant to read and hard to understand, but she's a scab. What can I say? Um, uh, the second uh, negative emotion that Jessica arouses, at least in my uh, bosom, is uh, envy, um, which is that Jessica manages to find insights that are very deep and very simple, and after she has pointed them out, deeply obvious to me, and yet somehow I'd never managed to point them out first. Um, and um, I recommend thoroughly um, her um, collected works. Maybe we'll put a, a link to her page up on the, the center site. Um, she's some wonderful essays up there, which I, I think you'll enjoy. I was just reading one of hers called War and Peace, which is about the copyright wars we're currently engaged in. Um, and she has a whole series of others that are, that are really uh, well worth reading, and I hope you will, as well as a great book called Digital Copyright. Um, so um, Jessica is going to talk today about copyright liberties, um, viewing copyright from, as it were, the other side of the prism. Um, I am going to get to listen to the first half of it, and then I'm going to run out and talk to a conference in Pittsburgh about copyright liberties. And I've already apologized to Jessica for that, and I do so now for you. Artie Rye will be handling questions. Welcome, Jessica, and thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I want to talk this afternoon about copyright liberties. So what's a copyright liberty? Uh, we all know what copyright rights are. Copyright rights are the exclusive rights to reproduce, adapt, publicly distribute, perform, or display. But what's a copyright liberty? So when I talk about copyright liberties, I'm talking about the freedom to read, look at, listen to, or view a work. Liberty to enjoy a work as opposed to, as distinguished from uh, the right to exploit it. and. I argue that copyright liberties are and always have been implicit in the copyright scheme um, and essential to its design. Now, they haven't gotten a lot of attention. Until recently, there was no need to think about them, uh, at least very hard, because copyright rights were narrow and bounded, and they almost never bumped up against copyright liberties. Uh, more recently, we haven't been paying attention because the mental models we're used to using to think about copyright don't really allow for them. And what I'm trying to persuade you of is that that needs to change, and needs to change really soon. So what got me started on this project was a paper that I wrote on personal use. And I started working on the paper without having any particular hypothesis or argument in mind. I just wanted to look at the range of personal uses, figure out which ones were clearly illegal, which ones were uncontroversially legal, and which ones occupied contested ground, and then see what, if anything, I could learn from which uses landed in, in which pile. Most of the discourse in the popular press and in testimony to Congress 
is about personal, about personal uses, concerns the ones that are clearly illegal. Everyone agrees this is an illegal use. Most copyright law scholarship, including mine, tends to focus on the stuff in contested territory. But for my purposes, the category I found most interesting uh, in this project turned out to be the uses that everyone agrees are not unlawful. Those have gotten less attention. After all, why bother? Nobody is going to bring a high-profile lawsuit on the basis of actions that everybody agrees are legal. Uh, so what kind of uses am I talking about? Well, stuff like reading and listening and looking at that are simply outside the scope of copyrights, exclusive rights. Um, but also things like backing up my hard disk or driving around with my car stereo blaring and my windows open or uh, this guy, this is an iPod. On my way down here yesterday, I played this iPod for at least an hour's worth of the flight. Okay. Now those kind of uses seem to be solidly within the copyright owner's exclusive rights under section 106 of the statute, at least if you take the statute liberal, literally. I mean, let's talk about this guy, for instance. When I press the arrow at the bottom of the scroll, I'm performing the music I hear. Because the statute says that I perform the music whenever I play it, either directly or by means of any device or process. Okay? If I do that on an airplane, I'm performing it publicly because I am performing it at a place where a substantial number of persons outside of a normal circle of, fam of family and its social acquaintances is gathered. Okay? So literally, play the iPod on the airplane, I'm performing it publicly. Now there are some potential exceptions in the statute. Uh, in section 110, none of which seems to cover this. The closest one is section 110.4. Uh, but that section only applies if the public place is one for which there is no direct or indirect admission charge, which covers no commercial airline I've ever flown on. Uh, we can run through this analysis. I mean, I can press the, the little button here, um, and I'll be performing it publicly in a public place, and 110.4 won't cover it because... We're being webcast, and 110.4 is limited to performances that are otherwise as a transmission, even though none of us can hear it, right? Because I don't have any earphones plugged in there, much less a speaker. So I can run through this uh, talking about the reproduction right and backing up my hard disk, or the derivative work right and sitting down at a piano and improvising an accompaniment to some melody. The language of the statute seems to prohibit it. Nobody thinks it's copyright infringement. Okay. So, well, what's the problem? Why is there any problem at all with stuff that isn't copyright infringement? Well, part of the problem is this standard rubric, which says that any use of a copyrighted work that fits within the literal definitions of reproduction, creation of a derivative work, public distribution, public performance, public display, is an infringement of copyright unless it's either licensed by the copyright owner or it comes within a statutory exception. There is no statutory exception that fits playing my iPod on the airplane or backing up my hard disk or noodling around on the piano. So they must be infringing unless they're licensed by the copyright owner or excused by the fair use privilege. So unsurprisingly, given this problem, there's a lot of scholarship that has focused on the argument that personal uses should be deemed fair use, either always or at least often. Now, that's kind of hard to do under the fair use test that we've got operating now. Uh, playing my iPod on an airplane is consumptive rather than transformative, so the first factor is not going to count in my favor. The music I play is a little quirky, but it's still the sort of thing we commonly think of as within the core of copyright protection. So that factor's not going to favor the use. Uh, I'm using entire songs, indeed entire albums of songs. Uh, and the fact that this use has become widespread is the reason why Northwest Airlines no longer buys a commercial music service or rents out those terrible headphones for domestic flights. So we've got pretty good evidence that my use and other folks' uses like it 
have undermined copyright owners' extant markets. Okay, now the fact that fair use doesn't do what we might want it to do here shouldn't be surprising. The four fair use factors in the statute date back uh, to the 1841 case of Folsom v. Marsh, when copyright only gave the copyright owner the rights to print, reprint, and vend. So copyright law didn't impinge on anybody's opportunities to listen to music or indeed to enjoy works as opposed to exploiting them by selling copies. So fair use didn't need to come up with a way to protect that sort of thing from copyright. You know, at the same time, the impulse to rely on fair use, uh, especially among scholars in the baby boom generation, is completely understandable because so much of us came of age as copyright scholars during a period of time when fair use did protect a broad swathe of personal uses from being deemed infringement under the 1976 Act. The Sony Betamax case decided by the Supreme Court in 1984 not only held that personal copying of television programs was fair use, but adopted an analysis under which most personal uses were fair. The court held that personal consumptive copying, like copying a television program to let you watch it later at your convenience, that those kinds of uses were non-commercial uses and that all non-commercial uses were presumptively fair. That analysis held sway for 10 years until the Campbell case when uh, Justice Souter said that the Supreme Court had never actually said that um, and certainly didn't mean it. But here's the curious thing about fair use. While the territory it has protected has changed a lot in the 30 years since the 1976 Act codified it, the size of its footprint has stayed relatively constant. When the Sony Betamax decision adopted a test that made consumers non-commercial copying uh, presumptively fair, it also adopted a contrary presumption for commercial uses. The test deemed them presumptively unfair. So we had a decade during which parodies and biographies, all of which were commercial, didn't qualify for the fair use privilege. The court replaced that analysis with one that focuses on whether the use is transformative and the fair use zone shifts to a place where it can shield the wind gone and ditto.com's image search engine, but personal consumer copying is now left unprotected. So I think we need fair use to handle the way copyright treats parodies and mashups. We need it for the stuff you see posted on YouTube, we need it for Google's book search project, and if we grab the edge of fair use and yank it over to cover personal copying and personal performance and personal preparation of derivative works, I don't think we're going to end up stretching it, we'll just move it. Besides, the kind of uses I'm talking about are uses that nobody argues ought to be deemed infringing. Well, that's interesting. I mean, why not? Why does no one think that my playing my iPod on the airplane violates the copyright statute, even though folks are perfectly willing to argue that technical, literal infringements like that are illegal? So I've got a theory about that. Um, my theory is that the idea that personal uses should be analyzed as implicating Section 106 rights is a very recent and very selective development and most of us are just too young to realize it. Um, so to illustrate what I mean, let me talk for a second about what I've taken to calling the trumpet problem. Um, let's use music as an example, since I've already introduced my iPod to you. Classically, copyright in works of music, and here I mean both musical works and also sound recordings of music, gave composers, music publishers, record labels, performers control over the kind of activities that allowed them to exploit their works commercially, making and selling copies and phono records, publicly performing the works, and so forth. I want to call those activities publishing for short. Okay. Meanwhile, copyright didn't give copyright owners control over what I've been calling the copyright liberties this afternoon individual listening, humming, playing the music. Uh, so let's call this activity playing for short. We've got a third category 
of uses that make use of music. There are businesses out there that make iPods, businesses that make VCRs, DVRs, CD players, also pianos and trumpets. Okay, these are items that you can use uh, to better enjoy, listen to, perform, play your music. So I'm going to call the category trumpets for short, because if I call them iPod for short, um, we'll be caught up in all sorts of questions about RAM copies I don't want to get into. The folks who make trumpets are in the business of making money, sometimes lots of money, for music that's written by other people and owned by other people. The entire business model of a trumpet manufacturer is the commercial exploitation of other people's music. So the people who own music copyrights would like a piece of the trumpet business or control of the trumpet business or the ability to prohibit folks from making trumpets or at least a royalty on the sale of trumpets. Now, until recently, nobody imagined that they could get that. Trumpet manufacturers, like the people who make pianos and DVRs and VCRs and iPods, don't themselves copy, adapt, perform, uh, display, or distribute works of music. But then we had the Sony Betamax case. Sony was predicated on a theory of contributory infringement, which meant that Universal Studios needed to argue that William Griffiths, that was the individual defendant in the Sony case, the guy who had a Sony Betamax and used it to copy programs, that William Griffith was a copyright infringer and that Sony, by selling him a Betamax, was helping him to break the law. Well, we've seen a bumper crop of those kinds of contributory infringement cases, and plaintiffs in those cases need to make the argument that what defendant Trump and Maker is doing is, play, is helping individuals to infringe copyrights by playing the trumpet. Now, typically, William Griffiths isn't there to defend whatever it is he's doing. The cases proceed on either the assumption or the concession that because trumpets can facilitate copyright infringement, making them might be contributory infringement. OK, but there's another possibility. And as I'm describing trumpets, I hope it looks more and more sensible to you, which is what if the standard rubric is just wrong? I mean, the standard rubric is certainly not true if what we mean by true is that Congress intended to set up a system in which all uses that don't have an express privilege are unlawful. I mean, the truth is that Congress adopted broad definitions for copyright rights, because that's what copyright owners asked for. It adopted narrow privileges for copyright users, because that's what copyright owners and copyright users could agree on but it expressed no views on whether the law included implicit exceptions that would shield folks who hadn't showed up to ask for statutory carve-outs. And there's a fair amount of evidence that Congress has always understood the copyright law to include a bunch of implicit exceptions and exclusions. Um, I've spent a fair amount of time wallowing in the legislative history of this or that copyright bill so I could pull out of my pocket a sheaf of examples. I'm just going to mention one now. In 1993, the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit held that it violated the copyright reproduction right for a computer maintenance or repair business to turn on a computer without authorization from the owner of the copyright in the computer's operating system software. Uh, because turning on the computer the court held copies the operating system software into the computer's random access memory. Now, this was a stupid decision run for lots of reasons, um, and folks came running to Congress to reverse it. And so Congress enacted an amendment in 1998 saying it is not either copyright infringement for a computer repair business to turn on a computer in order to fix it. Now, that creates a potential negative pregnant. If you're not a computer maintenance or repair service, or you're turning on a computer for some reason other than to fix it, you turn on the computer at your peril. Okay. 
Nobody believes that. In fact, consumer groups lobbied Congress to reverse the decision in more general terms or to enact a general privilege that would allow all of us to turn our computers on. And Congress declined to do that because members saw no sign it was necessary. No fool was going to argue that consumers break the law whenever they turn their computers on. Now, lobbyists for software publishers urged Congress to stick with the narrowest possible amendment, but they didn't argue that they should do that because when consumers turn their computers on, they're breaking the law and that's good. They said, look, uh, the RAM copy construction makes sense and we may need to use it later against some new commercial pirate of unspecified type. So leave that weapon there for us for later. But no one believed that we all violate the law when we turn on our computers. OK, I can run through six or seven uh, different examples. The bottom line is that members of Congress who are copyright generalists and who aren't privy to copyright luncheon circle law, what copyright lawyers insist they think the law means when they're talking to each other, uh, look at the law and they see implicit exceptions. In the paper I wrote about personal uses, I also explored a bunch of examples of courts doing the same sort of thing, reading the language of copyright statutes to incorporate implicit exceptions. Um, now, to find this out, you need to go back to the unedited versions of cases, the ones that aren't in the casebook, because when casebook authors are editing casebooks, we face the task of shrinking a 50-some page opinion down to the four or five pages that will give students the essence of the case for whatever purpose it is uh, we're including it. And the first stuff to go is the stuff that under the contemporary story of what the law says doesn't compute. That stuff we figure isn't useful for the students. It'll just confuse them. It isn't the law anymore if it ever was, so it goes out. So uh, a case that's not in case books anymore at all is 20th Century Music v. George Aiken, which I'm really fond of because I grew up in Pittsburgh, which used to mean that, that when the size of George Aiken's delicatessen was important for copyright purposes, I knew how big George Aiken's delicatessen was because I used to hang out there. My grandmother had a hat store named Dorothy's Millinery that was two doors down from George Aiken's Delicatessen. And I would go and hang out at her store after school. And I would commonly go to George Aiken's Delicatessen for a bad lemonade or, or terrible barbecue chicken, which is what they would sell you. In any event, what made Aiken a famous place for copyright specialists was the radio, uh, which was on all day long. Um, Mr. Aiken hadn't bought an ASCAP license, so he got sued, and the case went all the way to the Supreme Court, which held that what Mr. Aiken was doing when he played the radio in his restaurant wasn't performing at all. He was listening to it. And because he was listening rather than performing, it couldn't be actionable. Now, Congress overruled that definition when it adopted the 76 Act. It defined performance broadly enough to cover my playing my iPod on the airplane and Mr. Aiken playing his radio in his music. But there's nothing suggesting that Congress believed that recognizing implicit exceptions was a problem or that listening should ever be construed to be public performance. More recently, in Nintendo v. Galoob, Nintendo sued the maker of a device that allowed players to modify gameplay. Nintendo argued that Galoob was a contributory infringer because it enabled consumers to make derivative works. And the Ninth Circuit held that the individual players were not either making derivative works. Uh, they were playing the games they had purchased in the ways they wanted to. They weren't making derivative works they were playing. Now, that opinion is particularly incoherent. And, and you see it in case books, uh, bits and pieces, none of them coherent, to try and figure out what the court's rationale was for saying consumers aren't making derivative works. 
Uh, if you read the whole thing, you still can't do it because the answer is, as far as the court was concerned, those consumers aren't making derivative works because they're playing. They're their, their games, they bought the games, they get to play them the way they want to play them, so these can't be derivative works. Um, so again, I could go through a longish list. My point is that the courts have never construed the copyright owner's exclusive rights to give copyright owners plenary control over any reproduction adaptation, public distribution, performance, or display. And when literal application of the language threatens individuals' opportunities to read, listen, look at, view, or play, at least some courts have been willing to adopt narrowing constructions even when they don't make any analytical sense. Um, so uh, bottom line, the standard rubric's wrong. There are and always have been implicit exceptions. So how do we figure out where they are and what they mean? Uh, the ones I want to focus on are the ones that are represented by what I'm calling historic copyright liberties. And my argument is that when a literal construction of copyright, did work, of copyright rights has threatened to interfere seriously with individuals' ability to read, listen, view, or play, courts commonly refuse to construe the language literally. They found implicit exceptions. That's not public performance, it's listening. That's not creating a derivative work, it's playing a game. And understood in this light, uh, a whole bunch of cases that copyright scholars think of as outlier cases uh, make a fair amount of sense. For the past 25 years, though, the economic analysis of copyright law has been ascendant. So when we're thinking about copyright, we say copyright is a way of encouraging people to create and distribute works of authorship by providing incentives in the form of control. That way of looking at things doesn't pay any attention to what happens to works of authorship after they get created and distributed. So long as people buy them, we don't ask whether they read them or listen to them. Indeed, so long as there's a functioning market for copies of works of authorship, we don't care if all of those copies land in a giant warehouse somewhere for life plus 70 years and are not heard from again. I mean, obviously, the creation and dissemination of works of authorship is only going to promote the progress of science if people read the books, listen to the music, look at the art, watch the movies, play the games, build and inhabit the architecture. That point's so basic that we don't pay attention to it. Now, until recently, we didn't have to. Copyright rights were fairly narrow and bounded, and they didn't interfere with the liberties to read, listen, look at, and so forth. But in the 30 years since the enactment of the 76 Copyright Act, we've seen a significant, largely non-statutory expansion of the scope of copyright rights. Right? Now, when I say non-statutory, I mean the words in the statute haven't changed, but the scope of the right has grown. Technology has made it possible for individuals to make a variety of valuable uses of copyrighted works, Copyright owners have understandably wanted to make claims to control these new uses. Uh, they have in particular wanted a piece of the trumpet market. So they've argued for broad construction of their rights under Section 106, and at least sometimes some courts have gone along. So today it's not unusual to see exclusive copyright rights bumping up against or restricting or conflicting with historic liberties to read, listen, look at, and learn from works. It happens many times a day now. And that fact makes it more important than it used to be to figure out how to think about those conflicts. The late Ray Patterson argued that the purpose of copyright was to encourage reading and learning and that copyright exclusive rights should be understood and applied subject to that understanding. And even copyright skeptics objected that he was being extreme. Um, but I think he was exactly right on this point. Reading, listening, looking at, learning from are what we have copyright for. They have core importance in the copyright system because supplying all of the incentives necessary for the creation and distribution of myriad works doesn't promote the progress of science unless someone reads them. So I'm not talking here about how, tomorrow, how today's reader can become tomorrow's author. 
Rather, I'm suggesting that readers and listeners, reading and listening, have crucial importance in the copyright scheme for their own sake. And if we don't draw copyrights, exclusive rights, in a way that fosters copyright liberties, then the whole system breaks down. OK, it's all very well to say we need to construe copyright law to preserve historic copyright liberties. Some folks are going to object right then and there and argue copyright law is not supposed to protect any reader, listener, or viewer liberties. Uh, I can cite you a couple of shrill law review articles, insist that readers do not and should not have any rights. Only authors and publishers, licensors and licensees have rights. Uh, I'm not going to convince those people anyway, so I'm not even going to worry uh, about, about how to persuade them. For the rest of the world, the concept of copyright liberties isn't necessarily too controversial. Rather, folks are worried about where I want to draw this line. Um, so I can tell you where I want to draw the line, but I don't, in fact, think it's all that important at this stage. At this stage, the most important thing is to acknowledge that the copyright system has always had at its core a number of implicit copyright liberties without which the system makes no sense. What I want to achieve is this. I want to start a robust conversation about the nature and scope of copyright liberties. I think it's important that we have this conversation, and it's important that we have it now. Because we, I, my bet is that we are, right now, in the initial stages of a new reform revision cycle. The current 30-year-old statute is not working well for anyone. Uh, copyright divisibility turned into the disaster that some people said it would. Licensing is hard. None of the extant solutions is satisfactory. Increasingly, litigants are hanging liability on technicalities while the underlying behavior that strikes people as wrongful or rightful goes unaddressed. That spells revision time to me. Uh, now, it'll take years, for sure, uh, but it'll start soon. Indeed, I suspect it's starting now. I think it's starting already. So if we don't talk about copyright liberties now, we won't be in a position to make sure the coming revision includes them. But I promise to tell you where I draw the line. It seems to me, if you read cases going all the way back to Stowe v. Thomas, where Harriet Beecher Stowe was unsuccessful in enjoining a German translation of Uncle Tom's Cabin, the line you see court drawing is a line between exploitation, which is usually commercial and usually public, and enjoyment, which is often uh, but not always non-commercial in the Sony sense, and often but not always less public. I think that's the right line. Now, it's a line that moves. One enjoys works differently today from the way one enjoyed them 30 years ago, but the distinction captures the essence of the difference we need to focus on. We have copyright law after all. We tell people to encourage folks to create and disseminate works by bribing creators and disseminators with the promise of control. We don't need to bribe people to enjoy copyrighted works. They appear to be delighted to do that without external encouragement. Now, we may not need to bribe them to create and distribute works either, so long as the distribution mechanisms are cheap enough. But I'll leave that quagmire to another day. Taking it as a given that copyright should secure enough copyright owner control to make it worth copyright owners' while to undertake creation and distribution that we do need to bribe them to do, then it makes sense to draw the line to preserve copyright owners' abilities to exploit their works commercially far enough to make creating and releasing them worthwhile. But it makes no sense to allow them to expand to the point where copyright owner rights interfere with our ability to enjoy their works by reading, listening, viewing, watching, playing, and building them. So that's where I would draw the line. Judges basically interpret, don't interpret the law literally when interpreting the law literally with absurd results. 
sometimes, anyhow. I mean, there's MAIV peak where the court did. So, uh, so is that the reason you think that it's important statutorily to get it right in the first instance? Because if you don't think that, if, if judges generally will interpret the statutes to reach the right result, irrespective of what the statutes say, then it's not that important to get it right statutorily. But you're, you seem concerned when you're talking about revision well, that I, you get it right statutorily. Well, I'm worried about the trumpet problem. That is, I don't in fact think that copyright owners have any right to control the trumpet market. Um, I think that in order to get the trumpet market, though, they're insisting that they've got the right to control reading. Um, and because they insist on having the right to control reading, I think that Congress may very well give them that right. And then nobody sues William Griffiths. Even Universal Studios didn't really sue William Griffiths. Um, but if the court isn't answering the question, can William Griffiths watch television, but is instead answering the question, can Sony make a VCR, um, then there is no historic copyright liberty necessarily in front of the court. Great. Um, OK, we have lots of, well, at least one hand right now. <laughs> David. Uh, OK. Justin, let me ask you what is a question. I'm sure you've talked about but I don't know the answer from what you've said so far. Peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, is that a copyright liberty or, or not? Peer-to-peer um, -peer file sharing is, I think, not necessarily a copyright liberty. Because you're, I mean, I think listening to music and sharing music is a copyright liberty. I think that peer-to-peer -peer file sharing ought to be legal under 1008 and other provisions of the statute. But, and, you know, I would rewrite the statute. If I wrote the law, all non-commercial uses would be protected. But I'm not making the claim that all non-commercial uses are copyright liberties. I don't think that peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, which involves uh, publicly making available copies to the whole world, is historic anything. It's new. <laughs> and if we call it listening, it looks like a copyright liberty. If we call it publicly performing or distributing, it looks like a classic copyright right. Can I ask you a follow-up? Yeah. Not using an iPod, you understand, but... Yeah. I mean, I think downloading for your own personal listening pleasure is both a copyright liberty and is also completely legal under 1008. Now, the Ninth Circuit tells me I'm wrong, but... So it's the sharing that you think is objectionable when I speak about... Peer yeah, it's the sharing with large crowds. But you didn't object when George Aiken played the radio in his uh, chicken shack. You, that would have been a copyright liberty in your view, despite the fact that over the course of the year, I take it thousands of people would have been and heard and played the music. I don't know if thousands, but yeah, hundreds anyhow. Can you explain the difference? Okay, let me, I mean, I don't want... Uh, to say that how I would rewrite the copyright statute were I Congress or God corresponds to the distinction I'm drawing right now, which is a distinction between things that have always been core legal. Um, I think, for example, the solution to peer-to-peer -peer file sharing is probably something in the compulsory license or voluntary blanket license arena. I think it's unlikely that we are going to accept simply eliminating the distribution network from copyright. And I wouldn't want to argue that if you believe that copyright has always protected reading, you must therefore believe that copyright has always protected making your copy available for copying to 60 million of your closest friends. Jerry Reichman. I enjoyed your analysis very much, and, uh, uh, but I was struck by the contrast between American and foreign law 
in this regard as you sure. go along. So we have this fair use right, and foreign law doesn't. But then foreign law has this personal use right, and, and, and we don't. Right. And, uh, and then there's a question of where do they overlap and where do they don't, and, and they seem to be moving apart. And then you have the movement. I mean, uh, we, Rochelle Dreyfus has affiliated herself with this movement, but it's cropping up all over. Well, then what we really need are users' rights uh, that have to be codified because otherwise they'll be trampled on. And also in part because the digital use then tends to swallow the personal use right in Europe as well as the... Right. Uh, I don't know that they need to be codified, but they need to be recognized. I mean, what I think the recognition that Rochelle and Julie Cohen and Joe Lou and others are having is we forgot about them. We were so busy talking about incentives to this and incentives to that and downstream authors that we forgot about users and user rights. <laughs> I think the reason they, need, they think they need to be codified, and there's a lot to this, is that uh, in the international arena, uh, the we who forgot are not represented. And it's only the, the, the people who are pressing for more rights that are represented so that if, you're, if they're not codified at the international level, they will drop out and then become illegal in national law by default. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of, and then this has been picked up by the so-called WIPO development agenda in yeah. which one of the key planks would be uh, a codification of these users' rights to defend poor countries against the uh, imposition of these mm -hmm. clauses through trade agreements and otherwise. So. Uh, I see a link there that you probably want to make expressive, express in your in your uh, analysis because uh, you don't have to fight for users' rights in Europe. You have to fight to preserve them. But on the other hand, you have to you do have to fight for fair use rights, uh, which aren't there. And uh, I, I, I do think we need both, uh, right. a modern view of both. And I think you can't stretch fair use enough so that it covers both. Uh, yes, um, fellow in the back. Um, just a theoretical question. Um, I don't know how familiar with the Dan Brown book, um, Vinci Code, where it's copyright case in England, where they said he used someone else's intellectual property um, to write his book. How would that get you to take them up where they said basically, even though he used it, he had no, they had no copyright protection for his fictional work because he was using it only as a data source? Okay. Um, what they argued in the British case was that he used the facts um, and, and ideas as expressed in their historical books to write his novel. British courts said, as US courts do, copyright doesn't protect facts and ideas. It protects words. It, it protects plot. But that stuff that copyright leaves unprotected. So I'm not, I'm not addressing this to that. That is, I suppose, a kind of copyright liberty that we haven't lost sight of. We've all been talking about the idea expression distinction a lot. Um, what we haven't been talking about are, are things like whether my neighbor, when she reads to her triplets, can change the story so that it all comes out nonviolently. Um, <laughs> it's a derivative work. I'd, I'd argue it's a legal one, even if I object. Um, the use of theory or facts has become part of copyright law, and what I do with is medical. And some people think it's overreaching on that part to use something that naturally occurs, something that some by to someone can find, or a theory about how to use it. And that's been used as copyright or patent protection that is very, very restrictive. Patent is different from copyright. Well, actually, I know it is, but someone, I mean, I mean, a recent case that I was involved in, they used actually not necessarily the patent law, but the copyright law also, and I was trying to figure out how they say that. Maybe I'm speaking a little bit as a non-lawyer, but I came across as, that was the major point. That was actually the copyright part, not the patent. Okay, I'm not familiar enough with the case, I think, to comment. Uh, let's see, um, the fellow in the dark shirt back there. You're calling for codification of these, of the liberties, but where's that push coming from? Where's, I mean, obviously the, the uh, distributors and the publishers have quite a bit of funding with 
is it academia that's that's pushing for this complication on the other side, or where? What hope do we have for these liberties? To be <laughs> do you vote? Yeah, so do, you know, many, many people. The folks who used Napster before it shut down exceeded in number the number of people who voted for George Bush uh, in even his second most successful presidential election. Uh, by casting the issue as an issue of copyright liberties, my hope is that the kind of conversation we're having is one in which folks recognize that while copyright used to be an issue that was just for really boring people who like looking at details and, and perhaps charging lots of money for it, um, that the issues have expanded to the point where it affects all of our lives and that it's dangerous to leave it to well-heeled lobbyists. We've got 30 years. That's about as long as it'll take to overhaul the current statute. So uh, even if you don't vote copyright issues, maybe your children will. Uh, yes, there were men in the light blue shirt. Uh, yes, I'm asking this question from the point of view of a librarian and asking specifically about rewriting um, the use of the end, uh, the, the rights of the end user. How is that going to eventually affect libraries, especially in cases like Elsevier and online journals and having access? Probably very little because libraries problem is um, more than just a copyright problem. Libraries have a willingness to or have a desire to make information available to their patrons that trumps their unwillingness to sign egregious adhesion contracts. Um, if the libraries of the world or the country got together and insisted to read Elsevier that they had to stop doing that, maybe Reed Elsevier would stop doing that. I think what libraries are going to have to do instead is, is supersede Reed Elsevier. Uh, I've been suggesting for some time in other work that institutions with libraries in them should be archiving everything on the way out uh, so that one is in a position to make stuff available in alternative ways rather than buying the Reed Elsevier products on Reed Elsevier's terms, because I think that's the only way that's going to get them to compete. But some of it is because your ethos is, if I want to read it, you want to get it to me. You will let Reed Elsevier tell you you can only give it to me if you also promise them my firstborn child and yours. <laughs> so you're saying that, um, that us as librarians, that we have far more rights than we're actually using and that we should possibly push to allow as much access as possible? You've got certainly more rights than you're, agree than you're agreeing to. What's constraining you are these contracts, which say you have this, but notwithstanding the first sale doctrine, um, you're not allowed to let people look at it, except, uh, and you can't keep a copy. Now, some of that is DRM. And again, I think our only hope with DRM right now, since Congress is not budging on this, uh, is that the marketplace will reject it because it's really annoying. And we're seeing some scenes that that's hap signs that that's happening. Um, but a lot of it is contractual rather than copyright. You've got rights in the material that you buy that you're agreeing not to use. Um, the fellow right behind. Um. <clears throat> I guess I, I was wondering about uh, clarification on um, the line of the, the line of the sand where it comes to where it comes to derivative works. Uh, for example, my enjoyment is uh, making mashups. Uh, is that you know? Is that? Uh, That's what I meant by the line moves. That is, I think that uh, that somewhere the line has moved to. I think that making mashups ought to be protected under both uh, what I'm calling uh, copyright liberties and also the traditional fair use test. Um, you get some protection under the traditional fair use test because you're making mashups. 
and that makes it transformative. Uh, to the extent that more and more people are putting things together and that that's the reading of the 21st century, then I would like that to be off limits from copyright owner control until the point where you commercially exploit it. And, you know, then I think the copyright owner has a decent case to say, look, if you're making money incorporating my work, then, you know, you're not a trumpet, you're a competitor, and, and I would like some money. So is there a commercial intent? Uh, no, no, if you make it with commercial intent and, and no one will buy it, I'd leave you alone. Uh, <laughs> Well, and a follow-up to the mashup, when you put it on YouTube and Google makes money by placing ads. <laughs> well, Google's a trumpet, right? Google, Google has a 512, Google has a safe harbor that I think Google has, although I, I will see what the Ninth Circuit is going to say about safe harbors pretty soon. Um, that's a congressional call that while internet service providers were technically engaging in all sorts of reproduction of people's works and doing it for money, that if we said to internet service providers, you're going to be responsible for everything that moves through your computers, and so you've got to read it before you post it, the internet would stop. And so Congress enacted a system that said if it's infringing someone's copyright, take it down. That for right now, Congress has said, Google, you're entitled to make money off that so long as you take it down. That's got problems. People ask for takedown of stuff that isn't infringing. But that Google's making money, I mean, it's not exercising historic copyright liberties, but he is if he puts it up on YouTube. And I think he even is if, if he's got an ad sharing agreement with Google, although at that point it gets money, money. I'm less worried about precisely where the line is than that we all agree we have one. Um, I believe David had another question. Uh, do we have time? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Mashup. Yeah. People, when people produce those, because they're not doing it for themselves as a rule, they're actually doing yeah. it to share with others. Right. And they typically do it online, with yeah. web pages and the like. I, I want to circle around the YouTube uh, problem. Mm -hmm. How is that different from a peer to peer file share? Where the transformative. <laughs> <laughs> the transformative use consists of refusing to be bound by the record industry's playlist and preferring to simply produce your own playlist. The, you know, I'm happy to have the discussion in which you argue with me and say peer-to-peer -peer file sharing is more like reading and less like selling CDs or playing them publicly. I think I still come out on the side that says, no, that's just so widespread an interference with the distribution network that I don't think it's a historic copyright liberty. It may be that it ought to be permitted. As a policy matter, I would argue that it ought to be permitted because it does no harm and because if we don't need to bribe distributors to disseminate copyrighted music with control because volunteers will do it for free, that's good, and the last thing we should be doing is shutting it down. But I'm still going to resist that if we're trying to figure out on the spectrum, is this more like listening or more like distributing copies, that it's more like listening, because I don't think it is. Yes. I guess I'm a little um, curious as to see how you you mentioned the changes coming um, from the 76 Act and how we're at that time, but 
given that um, you know DRM can be really annoying, or there are different problems that we all, or liberties that we aren't really given on a daily basis, but do you feel like people are aware of those things? I mean, you mentioned before the amount of people who use Napster, different things like that, they're a little more high profile, but. Well, they're much more aware than they were of it 10, 20 years ago. Uh, 10 years ago, I think I could have come and give this talk and none of you would have been here because it would have been really boring. Because how does it have copyright? That's kind of boring and technical stuff. And those of us who work in the field could say, no, it's fascinating. Uh, but people didn't believe us. Uh, ten, when the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was making it through Congress 10 years ago, uh, those of us who thought it was just a train wreck and a really bad statute were trying desperately to interest reporters in reporting on it. And they would say, you know, I get it. I think it's interesting, but I've talked to my editor, and my editor is sure no one will read it, so I can't do that story. So there's a lot more public awareness 10 years later than there used to be. Um, and all of the signs I see are that it's growing, that as people are finding it interesting and they're talking about it and they're finding that this statute is completely counterintuitive, um, makes good cocktail party conversation. I think our IP classes in law schools are bigger. Uh, the number of general purpose law reviews who want to publish IP articles is larger. The number of IP symposiums is greater. The fact that all of this is happening around the world, and there are really fascinating problems of international coordination and international difference and international similarity. Um, so I think people are getting more interested, whether they will get interested uh, enough to make it politically disadvantageous to be known as the Motion Picture Association of America's Pocket Congressman is another question. I don't know. Questions like does the EFF being on Stephen Colbert, you know, actually trickle down and people taking action? I think so. I mean, again, ten years ago, no one had heard of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, I don't know about Duke. At Michigan, we get lots of applications from students who say, "I want to come to school, learn about intellectual property law, and go work for the EFF." And you know, some of them intern for the EFF every year. But that just was unthinkable 10 years ago. Well, I think we should at this point thank uh, Professor Littman for a very engaging and enlightening talk. And um, I hope if you have additional questions, you'll.